Hmm. I can't type. Okay. Let's go like this. That'll work. What's going on? This. A new follower. Thank you for the follow, Nelson Hernandez. Let's wait a few minutes for people to get in here. <clears throat> it's Friday. I'm having coffee. I just got out of bed. We're just hanging out. Oh wow, my charts look rough. We'll wait a few minutes for everybody to get in here. What's up, Gazelle? Fernando, Mr. Superstar, Bull Run High. A new <coughs> follower. Another new follower. Thank you, Brandon. I don't know. Let's give everybody till eight. I don't know. A few minutes anyway. This will be recorded, so if you missed the first part, you can come back, I guess. Let's just... I sure wish the market was open today, though. That'd be nice. Twenty eight people now. Oh wow, I should really get in live chat, huh? Weeble is commission free. Yes. And there's Elber. I'm gonna go in live voice on the Discord as well. <coughs> We might as well talk about supply and demand trading while we're here too. So people ask me about it all the time, so it's kind of the the business really. <clears throat> Alright, I'm gonna go ahead and start right, so this is Weebull. Weebull is one of in my opinion the best um free brokers available. It has good charts. 
it has a lot of access to indicators and things like that and uh, a lot of good tools really basically every tool you need level two data you have active trader you have a regular trade entry tab you have options tabs basically you couldn't ask for more I think the only other broker that is close to free that would even compare to this is thinkorswim but thinkorswim does have commissions on options and that really sets a lot of people off so um, <clears throat> personally if you're not doing advanced spreads Webull does have some functionality issues with like their debit spreads and their butterfly spreads and condors and things like that that thinkorswim is better at and the scanner is still needing a lot of work in my opinion but in the indicator library for Thinkorswim is just way more functional. But, you know, you get what you pay for, and Webull is free. So <clears throat> I do like Webull a lot. It is uh, my top choice right now. They're, they're improving all the time. And it's definitely better than Robinhood. So if you're using Robinhood, you should absolutely change to Webull because... If you want to trade like a professional, you need to use a professional software. And Robinhood is not a professional software. The charts are very basic. The tool set is very basic. And the functionality is just so limited. And you're limiting yourself when it's basically like taking the training wheels off, going from Robinhood to a real broker with the uh, tools that you have. <clears throat> so... I'm going to click down here on a customized tool set so that we can just start from scratch here, right? So this is what the normal Webull looks like. You see there's a whole bunch of different, you've got crypto trading, uh, multiple charts, day traders, normal options traders, whatever you want. But you can start with a blank layout too, and that's what I'll do today. So obviously, very first thing we, we see when we click on this here is this adds widgets box. I'm just going to click on chart. We're going to make a very basic sort of charting thing to where we can just kind of trade off of that. And you can add as many of these charts as you want. I'm just going to leave this at one for right now. If you need to delete something, you just click on it and click remove these little three lines here. So right now I've got a chart, just one. I'm going to size that down. So what else do we need here? Um, if we're in options trading, we definitely need to add options here. And what I like to do in this scenario is if you're swing trading options, this is fine, right? If you just pop it in with your chart, you see you've got options tab. You can just click back and forth from that. I'll show you another thing you can do as well in a bit that will make day trading options a bit easier right so you definitely need price quotes right so let's pop in a price quotes here I put that right up at the top of the corner and we'll adjust all of this stuff in a bit all right now we need time and sales I use time and sales if you don't use time and sales you don't need time and sales don't put it on your chart Let's put that guy down here. Order book level two. This guy, we'll put him right here. And any of these widgets that you want, you can just put them wherever you want, really. This doesn't have to be your setup as well. So, <clears throat> And you can adjust the sizes for all of these by just dragging the boxes. Kind of like... Uh, There you go. Let's do it like that. Okay, so we've got price codes. We've got level two orders. We've got um, level two quotes. Some people, me, I like to look at volume analysis sometimes. So I'll take that and I'll just drag it right up here with my level two quotes. Um, you've got uh, the NOI bar here. And this is... Uh, I don't really use this much, really. But it does offer some information like if there's an imbalance on one side of the orders like at close today there was definitely an imbalance of sell orders and that is definitely reflected in the chart here but most of the people we don't use it you can see there's no imbalance at open it's uh 
it can give you kind of a little bit of information if you need to use it, right? But volume analysis, we'll put that down here under the time and sales. This just tells you um, price levels where volume was traded at. So we can see that 15% of actual shares, 16% almost were traded at $443.31. So that's probably an important level if we were to return to that level at some point in time. Um, the rest of this stuff doesn't really make much of a difference. So trades, we have classic trades. This is just basically an order entry box, right? So we'll put that guy right here. And what you do, you can change your order type from market to limit to stop, stop limit here. Change the quantity, change whether you're buying or selling the limit price and um, day go to cancel orders here you can set stop losses or take profits and you can see if i were to buy spy at 437.83 with a 10 percent stop this is my estimated loss if that stop were to get hit and this is my estimated profit if my targets were to get hit i can change this by clicking the percentage if i want to use dollar values which i do so if I click there and change that, let's say I buy a spy at 437, I want a $1 stop, um, 436, let's say I want to stop out at 436, now I'm going to lose $183, so I want to sell it for 40 and there we go, now I've got stops, profit targets, <clears throat> and it's all right there, and then I just click this box here, or you can use the active trader tab. And the Active Trader tab is the same kind of story here. You've got, you can customize this as well. So you've got buy 100 at market, buy 100 at the asking price, which would be over here, buy 100, sell 100 at market, and buy, sell 100 at bid. You can change this as well. So you can go to Active Trade Settings, and what we've got here is this little box that pops up. You can do buy bids. You can change to buy on the bids. You can buy custom order type limits. You can change all of this, the quantity, the uh, stop loss, the take profit. So if you are a short-term shares trader, this is the tab for you for sure. You use this active trader. Let's just say you're trading uh, Apple or something, and you know that you're always going to be buying on the ask with that's just what you do. You always buy 100 shares. And let's just put our stop loss. You can do it this way. And you know that you're always going to have a 10% stop or a 20% target. You can just change this. And now you have an order. And you can set this up actually to a hot key, right? So you can use like shift plus uh, B for buy, right? And if you put shift B, that order will go in automatically. So it's the same thing. You can set these up however you want, but understand that it's always going to be exactly the same. So if you go from a spy or a, te a spy to a Tesla, maybe, or if you go from a Tesla to Bank of America, this 10% is going to be significantly different. So you may want to set this up for price ranges or actually use these buttons here instead. Right, so I feel like that. We've got reverse here. I don't use this button, but cancel all is an important one. You cancel all your orders. Uh, shows your position as well. Right, so there's all of that. Uh, then we've got none of this other stuff really makes matters. Of course, you know, banking, IPO orders, price ladders, all that stuff. But a lot of the people do use the price ladder to buy and sell. If you click on one of these, you can buy, put in orders through a price ladder. I don't like to use the price ladder. So there's that. Okay, so now we've got order flow. We can pop this up here in the stock chart. It's not important. We've got news. That could be important. So we'll pop that up there. We can drag those wherever we want. Uh, financial statements if you're a fundamental trader that's going to be interesting to you press releases same story corporate actions we'll drag it up there 
Uh, we've got analysts. This is something that I firmly believe you should completely ignore. Analysts, if they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't be giving you hot tips. They would be trading them themselves. Um, comments, If you, I just use this for laughs when I'm bored, really. But be careful about these Weeble comments. They'll, they're pretty toxic most of the time, and they'll definitely get you thinking that GameStop's going to go to $10,000 a share by tomorrow. And then, you know, it's it's just really easy to get on to. Um, I can't really show you how to do a debit spread on the mobile chart <laughs> without a mobile chart. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, you've got screeners here. Let's put a watch list tab from the general. We'll put it over here on the side. Shit. Well, we'll try to anyway. There we go. Let's put it here. Both. We can put screeners in there as well. But screeners is kind of a big tab, right? So let's put it actually here. And if you have a couple of different screens, this is definitely... All right. Uh, none of this other stuff. You could put most active up here if you like to see that as well. Uh, gainers and losers. Uh, populars. There. All right. So this is kind of where it gets into having more than one. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, more than one screen will help you, right? So if you have two screens, we can use a couple of different layouts. We can use one to like watch stocks, or we can use the other one for our scanners or anything or what that we use. But that's pretty much where's current current positions. Let's put it down here, and this is just how I set this up. There's current positions down there. Put in current orders. Put it down there as well. So you can click back and forth between your positions and orders down there in the bottom. And then that's pretty much the deal there. So now we can set up charts. And down here, normally you just put in the uh, order confirmation box or whatever in the space that you have left. So now what we do, let's go over this. So if you go to chart settings, right click on your chart, click on settings. Oof. We can do display. We can show the high-low price and all that does is pop the high-low into, see, under the chart, I leave that active. Show extended hours, definitely want to do that. Uh, overlap volume, I'm going to uncheck that. If you have uh, several indicators you use, I would suggest leaving that checked, but I only use volume most of the time on my chart, so I'm going to pop that off of there, right? You want to show corporate actions, this shows earnings, give you a little E, uh, stock splits, dividends, it'll show all that stuff with a little annotation on your chart <clears throat> highlight indicator values all this does is you see here this 437.69 the little default moving average if you click that huh well it's supposed to go away but anyway it doesn't go away <laughs> for some reason probably have to click done that it should make that go away right so crosshair fix, candles, gap, um, just leave that as none. It'll still show gaps on your chart. Uh, trade, display the cost basic. You can do classic or compact, make it smaller. Um, I just leave that all, all of this as default. Cost basis, default. Open orders, default. Uh, sometimes your chart will get stuck where if you drag it, it'll move up and down. If you change this from like linear to log, uh, to log chart and then back to linear or... There's a percentage chart here. It'll fix that. Right, so that's about it there. And then up next we've got, uh, let's do indicators. So you've got the indicators tab here. If you have some favorites, 
you can click this here and I do have favorites but you can click up here to um, change those right so there is that so all I want to add right now is volume so I just click on volume style we can change the style change the the line here and if you click on introduction it'll give you a short little spiel about it we don't need any of that all right so now I want to make volume a little smaller I'm just going to drag up to where it changes from volume to the chart here now I have a bigger chart smaller volume bars and there we go that's that's what we're doing for now you can also change your time frames here if you use different time frames like I don't use the th like let's say I don't use the 30 minute I can just uncheck the star 30 minute disappears boom see one five let's add the 15 in there uh, daily weekly monthly and there you go that's it right cool so <clears throat> Any questions about setting up Weeble? So like if you have two charts like this, this is the chart that this is the setup that I use on my other screen on the one on the left, right? And basically I just have four charts four small charts here all set to the time minute time, five minute time frame so this way let's say I create a watch list right and let's say today I'm watching uh, Apple um, spy oops and uh, let's put neo here so now I can watch Apple spy and neo all at the same time And this chart is the only one. I have this chart linked to this stuff. So top gainers, if I want to look at the top gapper and figure out why it's gapping up on news, I've got a news tab right here. So there it is in a quotes tab there. I can quickly swap between the news. Like if I'm trading a low float stock, I need to know these things very quickly. So let's say... Indo's gapping up 65%. I want to know why. Boom, click on it. Indo's right there. It's setting up for a flag. Um, I see news here and I can find out why. And I can click over on the quotes tab. I need to know a couple of more things. I need to know uh, the short interest and the market cap here. So I can see all of that stuff just on this one page like very quickly. And then I can figure out if I need to take a trade. Boom, take a trade. And then I'll just pop that over onto my main screen and it's cool, right? Oh, get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> Why will that not go away? That's going to be annoying. Unpin. Get out of here. Anyway, so, yeah. <laughs> Any questions about setting up Weeble? Do you let your orders run or keep watch? It really depends on the trade. You always have to kind of keep a little bit of watch on... Oh, I forgot. You have to keep a little bit of watch on your orders and make sure, like... Because you never know. Maybe you buy Tesla because it's a good technical setup and then Elon Musk comes out and says he's stepping down and that's a huge news event and you need to monitor that Okay, this is going to drive me crazy. Somebody help. It won't go away. No. Oh. Damn you. Hold on, paying attention. Sorry. Albert, this thing won't go away. <laughs> no. Oh, I just it clicked. Kind of, it was hitting behind you. I can't really see what it is. It's a stupid pop up from. CC Cleaner. Okay, so okay. one more thing. I'm going to change because I don't like this display for the watch list. Oh, that's my, my positions in my Roth IRA there. I'm going to change this to a simplified view because I don't like this display. It's really weird. 
So I like this one much better. Oh, one more thing as well. So I want to link this, all of this to the same group. Link everything to one. If you don't link everything to one, watch if I click on Apple, my charts Apple, my quotes are Apple, but my level two, if you look, is SPY. And I'm trading SPY. See the trade tab says I'm trading SPY. So make sure you link these to the same group or you're going to be getting false information or you're going to be looking at Apple and actually trading freaking Tesla and then you're going to be up shit creek without a paddle there. Positions you can leave blank but everything else link to one so when you click it it all goes to the same thing. Um, you can also click on your charts, right click on your charts if you click buy Let's just do it real quick. If you click buy at 67.55, it'll pop up a trading uh, notification there, right? I usually don't use this. I use either this Active Trader or this Trade tab here. Uh, what else? Analyst recommendations aren't trash. I mean, they're good at what they do, but at the same time. Like, one of these guys says this target's going to 77.80. The other guy says it's going to 30. And, you know, who's right, really? There's 7% of strong buy. Don't use analyst decisions as a reason to have take a trade or have a conviction. Now, there is a thing, right? So, like, if I'm looking at Twitter... And an analyst comes out and raises a price target from 40 to 80. That's going to cause a, f a fundamental catalyst. Now, I can use that fundamental catalyst to put Twitter on my watch list and find an actual technical setup, right? So if Twitter gaps up on this catalyst and let's say this gap fills and then bounces right i just got twitter on my watch list because i know whole oh, fundamental catalyst boom and then i can just create trades with that yeah okay so another thing right let's one more thing if you're an active options trader like if you're day trading options this is very inconvenient so what you can do is if you have a separate screen you can go to where did the little add uh, where the little widgets go come on now anyway oh, here just click on a blank spot add a widget uh, all widgets go click on an options tab here uh, trade uh, da, 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 da. where is it uh, I can't find the little options. Where is the little options tab? Anyway. Come on now. Am I crazy, Elber? What you there at? it is. Options. Click on this. Link it to one. And you can drag that wherever you want. Or... you can take this little options tab here and put it let's say put it here so now you can continue to watch your chart and click your stuff there poof that's what I'm looking for so if I click on one of those that generally will go right there. Now, you can even slap your little options deal down there. So now, you can use your option strikes and things like that from here. So like if you know you're trading seven day out options and you're looking at the 46 strike for instance 
you could just have that sitting right there and then boof now you're in there or you can have that anywhere you want really the sky is the limit people or you can even drag it off of the screen put it on a separate monitor like on a different tab and then use this to because it won't link if it's on a separate setup but what you can do is change this let's say I'm trading spy right now change that to spy and basically make that part of another one of my layouts and I can trade directly from there so that way I never have to leave my actual chart and I can continue to trade yeah now I've done screwed this up by making it anyway yeah, this is the deal uh, so question setting up we will I have made videos on reading level 2. <sighs> Watch premium charts. There's no such thing as a premium chart. I'm not sure what you're... There's no such thing as a premium chart. So, if there are no questions about setting up and using Webull, there's a lot of other things you can do here on Webull. Like if you click on the Markets tab, you got all of this. Play around with it. You got heat maps. You get top gainers and top losers and market watches and freaking inflow and outflow and global and all of these things. And this is just a default tab in Webull. It's pretty cool. Screeners. I, the Webull screener, screener is very limited in its effectiveness, but you can use it to create some basic filters. Like um, if you're a technical trader, you've got all kinds of crap here. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So volume is important. Price is important. Let's do percent change. Uh, technical indicators. None of that other crap matters unless you're using it right. So let's say I'm looking for things gapping up more than 2% in the pre market. With a volume, with a price between zero, uh, one dollar and ten dollars, or one dollar and twenty dollars, even right. I can change that and then do market cap. Let's do any market cap, you know, uh, region, United States filters, and then I've got volume. I want at least five hundred thousand shares traded in the pre market. 51 will be fine to maximum. And then any of these things, hottest, you can change it. Boof, now I've got a list of gappers. But Webull has a pretty, like, really, actually, a really good gap scanner already in this. Um, go back to customize. Webull has a really, really good gap scanner already. Oh, we're already back. This tops. If you're actually here and you're looking at top gainers pre-market, this is pretty phenomenal. You can literally see straight out of, straight out of the gate percent change. Highest gaps, you can change it by volume. This is the business for trading low floats it's like your own personal gap scanner but if you create it like this you can instantly see news you can see the uh, free float 90 that's too much float so right here 25 million float 41 cents gapping up 25 percent 38 million float gapping up 30 percent a new follower Anyway, yeah, we're not going to get on talking about penny stocks right now.
how can you get unlimited A trades? Uh, you can either do have $25,000 or you can run a cash account. With a cash account, if you have uh, $1,000 and you trade options, right? With an options, like let's say I buy 10 options today for $1 a piece. And let's just say out of those 10 options, I made 500 bucks. So that was my, my gain. So now I can't trade anymore today because I spent all of my $1,000. But if you trade 10 options in one day, you're probably doing something wrong anyway. So tomorrow, since I traded options, all of this will settle. And then tomorrow, I'll be able to trade with $1,500. So now I can do 15 $1 options or any combination of options that equals less than $1,500. Now, on the opposite side of that, if I have $1,000, let's just say I buy 100 shares of a stock that costs uh, $5 twice. That still equals 1000 I do that all today, right? So minus 1000 I have zero left today. So now with stocks, it's different. So stocks won't settle tomorrow. I need to skip tomorrow because stocks settle the day after tomorrow. So the next day, if I made that same $500, I'll have that $1,500. So if this is Monday and I spend all 15 on stocks on Monday, I won't be able to trade it all Tuesday. I'll be able to trade Wednesday with $1,500. So if you work this a cash account properly, even with just a thousand bucks, even if you trade stocks, you can trade. Let's say today is Monday, right? I have a thousand dollars on Monday. Let's say I spend five hundred dollars on Monday. So now Tuesday, I can spend five hundred dollars. So Monday, I spend five hundred bucks. Tuesday, I spend five hundred bucks. Let's say Monday, I made a hundred dollars. So Wednesday, let's say I lost fifty bucks so now on Wednesday I'll be able to trade with the $600 that I made on Monday but not the $500 that I made on Tuesday so now let's say I don't trade at all Wednesday anyway because I don't find any trades then on Thursday I'll have the entire balance again which would be 500 plus 150 minus $1,050 so now on Tuesday, I'll have the full 1050 But if I trade it on Wednesday, I'll only have what I traded on Tuesday. And we will tell you your settled cash every day as well in your account tab. So, but if you're just trading options, as long as you just trade options every other day. But, you know, I like to trade penny stocks and I've never had an issue running out of money with anything over a thousand dollars you just have to manage it properly well it's not going to settle this morning because the market's closed or you know day old you could just put 25 grand in your account Let's talk about that for a minute. If you have 25,000, just because you have 25,000, it doesn't mean you can just be a day trader, right? I would suggest that, because the thing is, if you have $25,000, if you end the day at 24,999 bucks, you're going to get a margin call because you're a pattern day trader and you don't have $25,000. So what happens is, is people start with 25000 and then let's say they lose 300 bucks, and now they're like, holy crap, I'm under $25,000, i am going to get a margin call. So now they're at 22000 and they keep trading trying to make up that 300 bucks. when really what they should do is stop. Now they're like, oh crap, now I've got $19,000, i am really screwed now. I'm going to have to put freaking so much money back on my account or I'm going to get banned from trading for 90 days. So get $25,000, don't day trade. 
you for your patronage. Oh, whoever just donated something, I appreciate it. You get twenty five thousand dollars. Don't T C T D C N A. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. Um, you get twenty five thousand dollars adult day trade. I suggest at least thirty. So that way, what you can do is leave twenty five thousand dollars in cash all the time. That way, you're never, ever, ever going to be under your $25,000 limit. Leave $25,000 in cash and day trade with five grand. That way, you've got a cushion of $5,000. But yeah, if you're just day trading, absolutely 100,000% use a cash account. You don't need $25,000 if you're only day trading or if you're only swing trading long options. There's zero reason whatsoever to have a margin account, especially as a newer trader. Use a friggin' cash account. You don't need margin. Uh, margin is a good tool once you already know what you're doing. And if you already knew what you were doing, you wouldn't be hanging out with me right now. So... Unless you're trading debit spreads and selling credit or things like that, don't use a margin account. Use a cash account. If you're just trading long options, you only need a cash account. Right? Right. Okay. So now that's all done. Let's go over to an options tab. So this is... A standard options tab right here. This is what it'll look like on almost every single platform you ever go to. Um, any real platform. Robinhood does not count. So we have a few things here. We have the strike price. And you can change this to um, ascending or descending. I leave this as default. Um, yes, all of the alerts get sent out on the Discord. So strike prices. This is closer to the money. This is out of the money, in the money, in the money up here. And all in the money means is this is a 53 strike. Price is 53.12. We are in the money by 12 cents. Right? 53 call options, in the money, 12 cents. 52 call options. All of these are in the money. These are out of the money options. Or... OTM, right? So that's what people mean. They say in the money, out of the money. Um, we have open interest. A lot of people get really, really hung up on open interest. Just because something has a lot of interest does not mean it's something you should buy. Open interest means absolutely nothing except liquidity. If something has two contracts and you want to buy 10 contracts there's not enough liquidity there for you to play your option it is not a buy or sell signal if you want to buy this 50 50 call strike and you want 20 contracts and there's only 15 you are not going to get a good fill pick a different strike but if something has 15 contracts it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad play pfe might run up. So this number means absolutely nothing except liquidity. Same thing with this volume. Things that do mean something, right? So let's say you see something here with like this with 3000 open interest and 9368 volume. That is interesting because with this many contracts Open interest, these contracts have changed hands more than twice in one day. So this is a very highly liquid strike. So this 55 strike, you could play that very easily. And it's possible even that this unusual sort of options volume could mean something, right? Like that's a very liquid strike. But generally, this is only liquidity. Price and volume is only liquidity. Don't or don't get all hung up on open interest because you don't even know the context behind this, right? If somebody opens uh, 15,000 contracts of a 51 put option on PFV, 
right? Somebody buys that. You also don't know, maybe they sold 70,000 call contracts or, you know, maybe they sold 50,000 of another contract. Maybe they shorted 50,000 shares of this and they're using that as a kind of a call, like a, a hedge. You don't, you don't know that information. Uh, thank you, Mr. Superstar. You don't, you don't have that information. So it's just open interest and unusual options. Well, volume is some people get into it. Uh, I think it's ridiculous. All right. So basically options, I'm going to go just to one side. Let's go to calls first. So what we have here, we have, I clicked up here to make it just calls. You can change several things from this chart. You can change your number of strikes, 20, 30, 40, 50, to all. I'm going to leave that at 20. You can change the spread here. See this little box? If you have level three options, I can change the spread from single to straddles to verticals to butterflies, to collars, iron butterflies, iron condors, calendar spreads. See, here's the, here's the issue with Weeble. Butterfly spread, if you're going to do four or five option contracts on Weeble, don't. Keep it to singles oops go back singles and straddles one and two option spreads anything three options four options the functionality is not the best right because you can't change these strikes individually like if you can only change the width so that's no bueno well it's not so much bad with a butterfly or things like that but if I wanted to do like let's say a uh, different strikes than these I couldn't that's why you can create things with vertical spreads though as well right so you can create condors with a vertical spread but I I don't like the functionality of Weeble for anything bigger than a two option spread it's just it's cancer all right, so back to single options. Uh, so what we have here is a bid price. The bids are the best buyers. The ask price, the best seller. The last price, this is what the last fill was at. Percent change, this is the percent change on the day. The mid price, this means nothing either. Just because it's a mid price doesn't mean that's the price that you're going to get filled at because you have the best buyer and the best seller. And what creates a transaction is either the buyer selling to the bidder or the bidder buying from the buyer. That's the only thing that will create a transaction. This mid price does not matter. Uh, implied volatility. Uh, this is a very important number for options traders. The higher the implied volatility, the more expensive your options contracts. The lower the implied volatility, the less expensive your options contracts. So in this scenario, this IV is 25%, which is fairly low. So the price of this contract is fairly cheap. If this volatility were much higher, this options contract would be much more expensive. So if this were like, let's say, 300%, this options contract would be two or $300 probably at this point. Oh, then we have open interest. We already talked about that volume. This is just how many times this contract is traded today. Now we're going to get into these. Okay, so options Greeks, the most important options Greeks. Delta, theta, right? That's it. This other stuff, gamma, vega, rho, all of that stuff, it does not really matter to us, right? doesn't matter to a lot of people unless you get into like some very theoretical options pricing. So like these are going to be, I guess gamma would probably be important. Vega is for option sellers, but you can get away with implied volatility. And rho doesn't matter either. So just ignore those. So delta, right? Higher the delta, the more money you make if the option moves up a dollar. So let's go over a couple of things. <clears throat> so delta, let's say the 53 call option here. If, let's just say I buy on the ask at 90, which is 0.9, right? Okay, so now I can see the delta. If nothing else changes, volatility doesn't change, and no days pass by, so let's say I buy this at 53, 
and instantly this goes up to 54. So from 53 to 54, let's just instantly, it's not going to happen, but for the sake of this, uh, this contract is going to be worth exactly $53.32 more than what I paid for it at 53 because it went up $1. So delta, $1 move in your direction is going to increase your options contract by delta. So if it moves another dollar in the same direction, how we come up with our new delta, general rule of thumb, we take our old delta and we add gamma to it. So now 53, 70, let's just say 74, 74 for our next dollar. It's going to increase by an additional $74. So we started with 53, now we're at 74, so now our delta is 74. And then that's basically how that works. Um, theta, of course, is these contracts lose value every day. So every single day, this contract, if nothing else changes, price stays exactly the same. Volatility stays exactly the same. Your theta is going to reduce your contract size by this much theta, $5.41 every single day. So volatility, if volatility goes up and you have bought a contract, your options pricing is going to go up. If volatility goes down, you buy a contract, your price is going to go down. If you sell a contract and volatility goes down, you're going to, let's just be here, buyers and sellers. So if volatility goes down, sellers are going to make money. Because when you sell an option, you are short volatility and short delta. And when you buy a contract, you are long delta and long volatility. So if volatility goes up when you buy a contract, you are going to make money. If volatility goes up. So that's basically the very... What? Is that Shankpo? Yeah. Oh, hey! What's up, buddy? Hey, sorry. I mean... My work schedule is stupid, crazy now. Oh, you're fine. We're just doing free. Uh, we're doing free learning stuff. We just kind of went over the whole uh, basics of options, <laughs> uh. and how to set up Webull, and we are about done with options. Um, oh, I didn't even mention like the okay. So call options, very basic. Since we've kind of talked about everything, price goes up, you make money. Put options. Very same thing. Price goes down, you make money. If you sell, price goes stays above your strike as a put, and that's very very basic things, right? Anybody have? I know there's probably a million questions on options. Anybody have basic options questions? Not let's. We're not going to get into theoretical like gamma and IV freaking squeezes and stuff like that. We're getting there, Mister Superstar. options questions and for specifically today we're not talking about spreads we're only going to be talking about long options I'm not talking about selling options either uh, we might talk a little bit about selling options but we're not talking about debit spreads. We're not talking about butterfly spreads. We're not talking about jade lizards. We're not talking about iron condors. <laughs> How do you choose the option to trade? That is a very loaded question. But yeah, we'll talk about it. And we'll talk about that later when we get into actually taking trades. How to trade trend changes in a small account with long premium uh again that's not an options question um, uh, we'll get to all of that when we actually get into talking about trading specifically how to pick strikes and which option to buy and 
how to create technical base setups with good risk management and all of that stuff that's coming in the very near short future does everybody understand delta theta gamma options pricings what a strike price is what a call option is what a put option is what they both do implied volatility and we know that open interest and volume don't mean shit except liquidity. It doesn't mean that just because something has 20,000 contracts that it's a good idea to buy it. Okay, cool. Shankpo, what's new, buddy? You want to add anything? How long have you been here? Uh, probably <clears throat> a couple minutes, not very long. Oh, <laughs> so you don't really have anything to add to the options conversation. No, I'm sure you did it great. Oh, okay. <laughs> what values do you try and buy at something lower than the mid? See, that's also a loaded question. There are different situations for different options. Uh, a transaction is created only one way. When either a seller agrees to meet a bidder at his bid or a bidder agrees, agrees to meet a seller at his ask. That's it. There's no other way to buy or sell an option. Now, uh, you that's market makers whatever dude the market makers still cut either coming down to the bid or going up yes. to the ask yes. period yep. so if you're at 440 and the seller's at 475 if you go to 450 and a seller says yeah i'll take that yeah. and sells it to you that is the ask moving to the bid if you're at 440 and you go up to 475 that's the bid taking the ask there's that's it uh, either a seller has to come to a buyer or a buyer has to go to a seller in certain situations um, it's okay to buy on the bid in certain situations it's okay to buy on the ask so let's say you're being very patient and you you think that something's going to pull back but you want to go ahead and get in list and you want to buy on the bid and you just wait you're fine there you just wait for the buyer to go down, or the ask to go down to the bid. But what you risk in that situation is you miss your trade altogether because you wanted a few extra dollars and getting in, which is fine. It happens, but that's just the risk you take there. Or at the same time, if you buy on the ask and you actually get that pullback that you were looking for and now you're in at a shitty average cost and you're nervous because you're down 20 bucks already it's just one of those things where it's like a what do you do kind of situation if we knew that you know right out of the gates every time we would all be much better but it's just impossible to know exactly what's going to happen 30 seconds from now or you know even two seconds from now Now we're going to get into some fun stuff, very basics of some technical analysis and really why that's all you need to trade. You know what I mean? So we're going to do some, some of the common indicators, but first, we're not using shit except some candlesticks and some volume bars. This is my preferred way to trade. Candlesticks, volume bars, nothing else is important. Shangpo would disagree wholeheartedly, and that is his right. And indicators do have their place, in my humble opinion. But at the same time, every single every single indicator in the market, I don't give a crap which one it is, lags price. So the order flow... Every single buy and sell order prints the candles and the volume. And all of these three things combined print your indicators. And that's just how it is. That's how it works. So if you wait on an indicator, you're always going to be behind. So if you don't understand market context and market structure, you your indicators will not help you fight me. <laughs> 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 um, so people start backwards they look for magic combinations of indicators and they never understand very basic market structure so we are going to remedy that right now so markets move only three ways P 
Period. There's no other way. They move. They trend up. They trend down. Or they channel sideways. So that's it. There's no other way a market can move. And right here we can see all three of those things happening. Sideways. Trending up. Sideways. Trending down. Sideways for a minute. Trending up. Trending down. So basically that's it. It's all that happens. And understanding what current context of market you're in is going to basically kind of make or break the whole indicator situation because certain indicators do not work in certain kinds of markets. Bollinger Bands are very, very good in a sideways market, but they're not so good in a strongly trending market. MACD, RSI, and things like that are going to be better in a very strong trending market, your momentum indicators. But Bollinger Bands, they do work in certain situations in a trending market, but they don't work as well as they do in a sideways market. So that's just kind of what I'm, what I'm going with here. But same kind of story. Markets move three ways. Sideways, up, and down. That's it. They don't move any other direction. doesn't matter what stock, what ticker, what time frame. You can look at a daily, a weekly, an hourly, a monthly. It's always the same. Down, sideways, up. That's the only three ways a market can move. So, and in the very basic context, that's it. Like, you can create trades with only that information, right? So, if you know how to do some very basic things like draw trend lines and support levels. So basically, let's start with a trend line. So a trend line generally takes three points to be an actual valid trend, but some people can, you can draw a tentative trend line with two lows. So for a trend to be valid, I, an uptrend, it has to be creating higher lows as well as higher highs. So if we can see here, higher high, I'll just draw it right over the top. So this is a, the low point. This is a higher low. This is a higher low. This is a higher high. Higher low. This is not quite a higher high, but you see it starts trending sideways here for a bit. And then it starts trending again. Higher high. Higher low. Higher high. See, at this point, it could turn into a downtrend because this is a flat low. Right? could go the other way, but instead it trades sideways for a bit and then pops up to an uptrend. Higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low. That's why market context is important because as a shorter term trader, at this point, if you're still in uptrend mode or you've changed to short sell mode, now you're screwed because you're not doing anything except pausing for a little bit, right? So in the context of the situation, you have to be patient and wait for certain things to become true, right? So if this point here, you're still in a sideways market. You're not actually in a downtrending market until that point breaks and prints a lower high. So that at that point, you can swap. And of course, this is where you get into the whole sort of um, technical analysis conversation it's all very subjective so like i might see one thing and you might see another thing and hindsight is obviously 100 thousand percent 2020 so that's why managing your risk is super important but we're talking about trends right now so let's not get into that so higher lows and higher highs trends so to draw a trend you take this little button drawing pencil tool, grab your trend line, grab the higher lows, and you connect them. Right? And you can adjust this, and this, and I'll actually even talk about why I don't personally like standard trend lines at all, because you can draw this here, you can draw this here, you can draw this here. General consensus is connect as many points as you can but as we can see you're always adjusting that that's why I don't necessarily like 
trend lines, but they do have their place, right, in just basically determining your bias. And for me, in this scenario, long term, bias is up 100% because the whole market is moving up. And in so in this scenario, I can see the whole market is trending higher. So I don't want to take long-term short positions here. I want to take long-term buy positions. And what I'm going to do personally in such situation is a long-term buy, I'm going to wait for a move to near a trend line to go long, or I'm going to wait for a move to a significant support level. And we'll talk about supports later or standard you know kind of chart patterns like this one bullish engulfing pattern right poof good trade so very basics of trends is a very simple concept and the reason i don't like them is because they're very 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 interpretive so like Okay, one guy might draw a trend here, another guy might draw it here, another guy might take it and draw it here. Um, it's just there's so many different ways. It's very interpretive, right, to draw trend lines. So I generally don't. I look at the market and figure out kind of the context of the entire thing. Whole thing's trending up, so I'm going to be long biased. Whole thing's trending down, I'm going to be short biased. Whole thing sideways, I'm going to trade either side. It doesn't matter. Right? So, trend lines, they're cool, but not my favorite. Three points makes a valid trend. Two points makes a tentative trend. A lot of people do like to trade the... third touch of a trend line so boom 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 same story what's the time range for the whole thing what do you mean for a trend uh, there's an old saying that the trend is your friend until it ends so there's really no specific time range for a trend like there are different time frames like you have a long-term trend you have a middle-term trend and you have an immediate trend so you'll get your long-term trend from a daily a weekly a monthly chart so we can see right here long term pfe has been trending up since 2009 yeah pfe has been trending up since 2009 daily chart pf has been trending up since COVID in 2020. Hourly chart's probably more middle term. We can see there's definitely some downs here. There's some sideways and there's some ups. So you have to be, you have to cons take into consideration all of the trends. So if you are short term trading and the longest term's up, the middle terms are all also up and you are trading on an hourly chart. If the daily and the weekly are both up trending, you're going to have a higher probability of being right because every other trend is in alignment. It's just trading confluence. Well, the trend is your friend until it ends is the, the age old saying. Um, it's been around since like the dawn of trading, but the trend doesn't always have to be the same. So like we just looked at PFE here, the long-term trend is up, but if you're in this box here, the middle term immediate trend is down. So necessarily, it really just depends on the amount of time you're planning on holding it. So if you are looking to go long PFE like now, this whole trend is up. You would wait for this kind of immediate term trend to turn down and then sideways, right? So down, sideways channel, higher low, right here. Oof. 
right? So just confluence. It's all about understanding. And you're not always going to be right. It just doesn't happen that way. It's just about confluence and understanding the context of the market. So same thing. This is an uptrend. This is probably a middle term and immediate term downtrend for several weeks. But market context, long term, you're still up. <laughs> But yeah, I don't necessarily like trends so much personally because they're very, 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 very interpretive. I prefer horizontal price levels to, to diagonal ones. Yeah, so let's talk about that, I guess. Horizontal price levels. Uh, so all the horizontal price level is is basically... Support resistance level. Super simple. Um, let me find a real nice sideways channel here. For day trading, what's a good time range? Uh, that's um, subjective. Some people day trade on an hourly chart. Some people day trade on a one, one, one minute. Some people day trade on a five minute. Some people day trade on a 30. Some people day trade on a 15 minute. And the simplest answer is, is the best time frame for day trading is the one that works for you. I like to use the five, the one minute for the first hour and a half of market open, the five minute after that. But I also use the hourly and the daily charts. And I look at the weekly charts for some things. Like if something is popping into a very, very, very strong weekly support level, that's something you need to know. So the correct answer is all of them, I guess. Like there's no one single time frame that's more important than the others. It's basically one chapter of the whole kit and caboodle, one chapter of a book. You wouldn't just buy a book and skip straight to the end and read the end, which would, would be what I consider like a one minute or a five minute chart. You would start at the beginning, which is the weekly chart and work your way to the end. Right? So like if I start on a weekly chart, it's the whole thing I was saying, market context, the weekly chart context is up, right? I've got important levels on a weekly chart that are going to matter in the very near term. So like this level is important on a weekly chart. This level is important on a weekly chart. And these levels might matter in the near term. Okay, so daily chart now, I have the same thing. Daily chart, I have important levels on a daily chart that are going to matter in the very near term. I have a trend that's going to matter in the very near term on the daily chart. That's important. And then the same thing on the hourly chart. I have that same thing on the hourly chart. Look, sideways for three days on an hourly chart. That's important. Important levels. So just seeing this and knowing what I know, if I were long biased here, and I know this is channeling sideways, I can see that there's a very strong daily level here that I can wait for to go long at. If that level breaks, I can see that there's another strong level below us here that I could wait for to go long at. If I'm short biased, I can do the same thing on the other end. Market context matters. Okay, back to daily chart. We're going to do horizontal support and resistance to start with. So all a horizontal support is, is basically a price level that a stock either bounces from would be support. So this is support or a level that price rejects would be resistance. So sideways channels, it's going to look like basically a sideways channel. Up channels, it's going to sometimes look like this and maybe it'll retrace to an important level and two things can happen at those important levels either the support holds or the support breaks so that's the only two situations at this point so from these points and this is why i like horizontal price levels from these very very important horizontal price levels what you can do let's just assume that 
now we've done this and we're back at this very important price level. So only two things can happen, right? We can go up, we can go down. So from these levels, we can create very low risk trades. So this is the way that I trade and it's not hard, it's not difficult, it's super simple. If I am long biased, let's say this starts to pop this way, right? If I'm long biased and this starts to respect this, I get in, my stop is just below that important level, my targets are previous market, previous market structures. Boom, that is a low risk trade because I have a very, very well defined level that I'm trading around and I have very tight stops because I've been patient and I waited for these important levels to test and I created a very low risk trade and that's basically all that this is about is creating low risk high reward trades and it's as simple as that so now on the other side of that if that important level breaks I can create a low risk trade the other direction and stops just above it and targets at previous structure lows same story I create a low risk trade with a good potential reward and that's all there is to it so very basics of kind of support resistance is like you see it's not always going to be perfect like right here we can see this general sort of area is a support level right it's not perfect you've got some wicks below but if you look at these <coughs> what no sorry i sorry i thought <laughs> it was on mute <clears throat> my throat oh that was me too i was doing that this morning did it was you want about food thirty? I'll see you home just a little bit. Did you want to say something, Shankpo? No, 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 no. Sorry, it was literally me clearing my throat, and in like I got shit in my throat. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. So, anyway, back to horizontal. We can see that they are not perfect. Price is not always going to be exactly perfect. So these are slightly interpretive, but they are much less interpretive than a diagonal's trend line in my humble opinion some people swear by trend lines that's just not my jam i like horizontal support levels because they are less interpretive right so very we can see that price just kind of respects this general sort of support area as opposed to just an actual specific price point right so that's where your candlestick patterns and things kind of come into play we see at this general kind of area here that we have long candles with long tails and they close near the top of their range and we didn't even talk about candlesticks did we so okay let's do that real quick so basically this candlestick even though it's red super bullish and the whole reason for that is doesn't matter if it's red what happened in this one candlestick, this big long tail, let me zoom in on it as much as I can. There we go. Is price opened way up here? Bears pushed the price all the way down to these lows at some point during the day. And what happened is, is that bulls pushed the price all the way back up to close it near the high of this candle. It doesn't close all the way quite at the high, but it closes really close. That is a bullish pin bar even though it's red it doesn't matter what color it is that's a bullish pin bar candle and you see in the context here this very bearish candle the day before price opens here and bulls basically did nothing all day they pushed it up just a little bit and bears took complete and total control and pushed this price all the way down to close at its low of the day so now in context reversal patterns generally kind of look like little v's on your chart a bullish reversal three candle pattern right here this closes above this high you have a bullish reversal pattern it looks like a little V and in this scenario same kind of situation very bullish candle indecision candle closes near its mid-range and then the next day sort of an indecision candle as well because bulls push it Bears push it down, bulls push it up, closes kind of close to the middle, and then a very bearish candle following that, and then two bearish days afterwards. Even though they're green, it doesn't matter the context, right? This is sort of, I would consider this kind of complete right here, and then that next day, you get a super bearish candle. Hey, thank you for whoever just followed. I appreciate it.
So that's basically kind of where your candlestick patterns and things come into play. So if you're looking at this level and you get to this point here and you see this, you don't want to get in until this actually confirms something. I would say that the size of this pin bar in this situation, let's ignore earnings, right? That doesn't matter at this point. The size of this pin bar would be all the confirmation that I really needed personally. That's huge. The tail on this is like $4. So that in my situation would be okay, let's do this and get in long right here. But I would put a stop probably there. If that didn't work, I would put the stop below where my original level was. And then I'm targeting either, you know, an hourly resistance level or if I'm longer term here and at 40, 45 days, I'm targeting a higher market structure, right? So this would be sort of my trade here. And... Obviously, we know that works because we can see the chart, but that's kind of the deal. You just create low-risk trades, and in this situation, my risk is like this small, and my target is like six times that. So if I win this trade one single time and lose it the next three times, I'm still going to come out of ahead in that situation. And that's why, personally, I feel like when people ask you their win rate, it doesn't really matter. And I don't know. I don't know what my win rate is. I don't care what my win rate is. Uh, the only, I just know that there's a positive expectancy to the trades that I take and that they make money more than they lose money. And that's all that really matters. And that's why in my, like taking signals from people, if you don't understand how to manage your money, signals aren't going to work for you at all, period. It's just not going to happen. So, Right, and then same thing sort of kind of in this situation is if I have this level marked and I see market context is this candle is super, 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 super bearish, I'm not going to just bump in right here. Maybe the next day when it prints this big pin bar, I can bump in or even the day after that when it confirms that pattern. Same thing, Vs. Maybe that's when I'll get in. And then we can see context at this situation is Right here, you see some very bearish candles that are rejecting pretty hard. They've both got really long tails. So this is an entire level in this whole situation that I want to watch. And that could possibly even be my price target here. And if we can look and see in this situation where this sort of rejection zone is is where that actually rejects in price. Twice. Everybody following us so far on horizontal support and resistance levels. It's not always perfect. Here's one that is perfect. Sometimes it is perfect. Same thing on the other side. Horizontal resistance. Resistance here resistance here resistance here and a breakout same story old support becomes or old resistance becomes new support breaks out you can create low risk trades in this area as well so here's the breakout there's two ways to play a breakout you can either get in as soon as it breaks out or wait for this retest where it holds this old resistance as support. The risk in trading breakouts is if you get in super early, it might be a false breakout and fall right back in and stop you out. The risk if you wait for a retest is it might never retest and just keep running straight to the moon and then you've missed your trade altogether. So it's a trade off there. Do you want to be safer or do you want to lose more and catch more of the actual move? No, support's definitely, there's nothing that's ever going to be 100% perfect, period. There's always going to be some reason or other why you shouldn't take a trade or why you shouldn't um, put a line in a certain place or why you shouldn't draw a trend line a certain way. It's There's always, always, always going to be something that's not perfect. And me personally, 
I have a statistical edge in trading horizontal price levels, so I trade horizontal price levels. You might have one in trading trends. You might be better at trading trends than you are at trading horizontal price levels. That doesn't mean you have to do what I do. It means you do what works for you and do what you do. Like, Shankpo is stupid good at picking fundamentally strong stocks and wheeling them. I'm not so good at that because balance sheets give me cancer. Uh-huh. And I love balance sheets. <laughs> they, I can't, but a candlestick, a candlestick in market context, I can prattle on about that shit all day. It excites me. Ah, yeah, charts, I mean, charts and graphs and graphs and charts and candles. Yeah, yeah, like I'm definitely not, that's not my gig, but yeah, I think I agree with you. Like the thing is, if there's if there's something that I would highlight about what you said, is that you have to love learning. Like you have to love to learn. And then in that learning, you find what works for you. Absolutely. And, you know, there isn't like this magic, like, oh, okay, well, I can just learn this one thing yeah. and I will be fine. No, you have to learn all the things. I you still learn just... every single day. Like I still study new books and listen to new seminars and like, I just yeah. recently, just recently, like, did a huge deep dive into, like, volume price analysis and correlation and volume and price levels and things like that because that fits into my sort of style of trading, like, important price levels and volume at important price levels. And once you figure out your thing, then you can focus your studies on your thing, right? If you're not a trend trader, like studying about things that correlate to trading chain trading trends is not something that you would need to do but if you are a trend trader and somebody does a freaking seminar on uh trend volume price analysis then fuck yeah jump in there Or like Shangpo, if somebody does a freaking seminar on the fundamental basis of Tesla's fucking 10-year bond yield and correlation to the SPY EPS and... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that. <laughs> that's something you should listen to if you're Shangpo. <laughs> well, it's not even if you're Shangpo. It's if, even if you're not. Like, you should listen to it, like... I've been in here listening to Volk and I learned some things and I think like you know that's the whole point is it's like oh yeah there absolutely are, there are certain there are certain things like even you know Volk and I may disagree you know about a particular you know particular style or particular method or or but I have a tremendous amount of respect for the way he does you know the way he does his trades and and he has for mine and and there are many times when we're both looking at each other like, hey, this this is good, and we both think we're right, and we're sometimes we're both wrong, right? Um, being wrong is not is something that you need to get very, very, very comfortable with. Okay, with yes, very comfortable exactly. with immediately, because yes. the simple fact is, and let me just find something here. Okay. Yeah, this will work. Okay, so we're looking at my charts here, right? Let's say, just for simple sake, that um, I'm going to draw in a candle here, okay? Let's say, for simple fact, there's a candle right here, and it's green, and it's bouncing. Okay, so let's say I take this trade. It's a good trade. That's a great trade. This is a support level. It's bouncing from that support level. I got in at a good place. And I have a target up here, so I have good targets. And I say to myself, okay, I'm going to get out if this level breaks. The issue is, right, we know that if I take this trade a hundred times, statistically, I'm going to make money over 50% of the time. I don't know the exact number. I think it's like 65% of the time depending on you know context right this is earnings again ignore this as earnings um so statistically let's just say i'm right 53 percent of the time so 53 percent of the time i make money so with good favorable risk to rewards let's this is about three times 
this. So let's just call this 3R and we'll call this 1R. So this is my one times risk level. So statistically, I'll make money 53 times out of 100. So what happens though and what people really, really get screwed up with is that they get it so stuck in their head that they have to be right. And when it doesn't work and they're not right, they don't do what they're supposed to do. So this next day, let's just say this gaps down to here. At this point, you know you're wrong. You already know you're wrong. And with options, sometimes that's going to be a much bigger loss than you anticipated, which is why I say with options is that you should never risk more than you are willing to lose 100% of. If you want to risk $100 on a trade, buy an option that's worth $100. Don't buy an option that costs $200 and assume that you can get out at 50% because if it gaps down and now you're down to $180, what do you do? Right? If you want to risk $100 on a trade, spend $100 on the trade. With options, they're already very highly leveraged. So you're going to make stupid good money if you're right anyway. And if you're wrong, you're going to lose what you wanted to risk. If you're wrong and you risk more than what you assume you're going to risk, and you lose more, and then you start freaking out like, holy crap, my stop loss was $100, and now I'm down $175. Well, screw it. And then what happens is, like, ooh, maybe now I'm going to buy two more. Now my average cost is 50 and I just need it to go up a dollar, and I'll make all my money back and another 100 And then it keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going. This is where you get screwed up. You have to be able to admit immediately, okay, that didn't work. Mm -hmm. that didn't work i'm going to close it and try again next time so two things will happen either you'll feel like a champion because it dropped another freaking 20 dollars, or it'll turn around and go exactly the way you thought and then you'll be like well shit okay that doesn't matter either that happens to all of the time like right here for instance same exact scenario same level let's say i bought an option right here and my stop loss is right here and then two days later it freaking turns around and goes to 40 you know all the way back up to my price targets that happens the best thing to do in this situation is take this trade like you normally would this isn't a good trade by the way this is just for example sakes stop out where you should stop out now you haven't lost this extra hundred two hundred dollars here and then when it comes back take the trade again and now it works look what happened you lost let's say your targets are three to one this is one r risk this is three r risk so what happened is in this scenario you lost one the first trade didn't work so you lost one the second trade did work so you made three now you're up two times your risk so now you have two times more whatever you were risking than when you started. If, in the other situation, you had taken this trade and instead held it, and then finally down here you're like, well, crap, now I've stopped out. Now you've given up 3R, and then when it does turn back around, you're feeling nervous, you're feeling shitty, you missed the last one, screw this ticker, I'm not buying PFE ever again because it sucks. And now you've done screwed up your whole brain instead of just taking, let's say, a $50 loss here and then turning around and waiting and being very patient for the thing to happen again that you've been waiting on. And it does happen again. Now you made 300 bucks, you lost 50 bucks, you're up 250 bucks. You lose all of the time. And sometimes you lose three or four times in a row. And that happens, right? But if you're always very disciplined in this is my trade, this is where I stop out, this is where I take profits, it doesn't matter how much you lose in a row because eventually you're going to win 10, 15 times in a row. And sometimes you're going to lose 10, 15 times in a row or probably not 10 or 15 times in a row, but you know what I mean. It just happens sometimes where you have shitty streaks where you lose two, three trades in a row, and then maybe you'll win five or six trades in a row. The thing is, is that you can never know for certain when those losing streaks are going to be, when those winning streaks are going to be. So that's why it is important to always have a statistical like edge, a setup that gives you that statistical edge. And for me, that's trading horizontal price zones. 
and I do that without question every single time. If a setup is valid, I'll take it. And that's because I know that even if I lose three or four trades in a row, I'm going to make money because I have a statistical edge that works. Did I lose people? We started talking about craziness. <laughs> we started talking about craziness, Shank Pro. Did I lose people? No, I don't think so. Okay, cool. <laughs> but while I'm sitting here looking at uh, this PFE chart, here's another very common sort of um, vertical level. Price gaps create strong price levels. Right? So gap fills. Even if you only learn one thing from this, let me teach you a kick-ass trading setup. See this huge gap? See how it slowly grinds its way all the way back up here and fills this huge gap? And then prints sort of a little mini sideways channel here for a day or two. And then when that sideways channel finally breaks down, this would look way better on an hourly chart. Look what happens. It breaks down on this candle. It retests that gap as resistance and then runs all the way back down to market structure lows. Create low risk trades. This is a low risk, high reward trade this is what this is what it's about and if you only trade one thing and that one thing that you only trade is gaps you can take this trade over and over and over and over again the exact same way you can do short gap fills you can do long gap fills you can do anything and it just learn one thing at a time. One setup. Trade one setup. And that one setup can turn into two or three setups. I literally only trade like four things. That's it. And it all... Actually, really, I only trade two things. I take uh, supply and demand trades and I take VWAP trades. And that's pretty much it. Supply and demand has four setups to it, and um, VWAP has a couple of setups to it as well, but it's all basically the same thing. But I have taken a lot of, I take that back, I like consolidation patterns as well, I like trading breakouts from consolidation, I like squeeze patterns. <clears throat> Everybody uh, very clear on horizontal price levels? It's very simple to draw a horizontal price level. And since we're talking about horizontal price levels, we can um, take, it, take it up a notch and talk about horizontal price zones, i.e. getting into supply and demand trading, which is, in my opinion, the one true and best and only way to technically make money. <laughs> Shane Poe probably disagree. No. Supply and demand is literally the friggin' business. Well, supply and demand is how capital markets work. You know, I mean, that's how our economy works. They're hedge funds, professional traders, head, like hedgies, the, the big, big money players. They literally, they don't care about technical indicators. They don't care about nope. any of that stuff. All they care about is, is insider information. If something is expensive or if something is cheap compared to its fair price value. And that is the entire basis behind supply and demand trading. You find areas of imbalance and you trade that imbalance. Whether there's well, it's a, arbitrage at that point, right? Where there's, I mean, it's that's basically what they do is arbitrage. Where where there's an imbalance of 
buyers or an imbalance of sellers is the deal, right? So let's just do it, right? So supply and demand, there's four setups to supply and demand. And the first setup is um, what happens is price does whatever the hell price wants until it gets to a location where it bases. And at that base location where it sort of kind of bases out, buyers and sellers are shortly in agreement on the fair price of a security. So if it trades sideways and then an imbalance is created when one side basically overpowers the other and creates a very strong price rally from that location. So setup one creates a strong price rally from fair value. And what happens is, is institutional traders and hedge funds, they are very patient in how they trade. If they put in an order at, let's say this is 10 bucks, right? This is $10 per share. They put in an order at $10 per share for, let's say, 50 million shares of ticker, whatever the hell this ticker is. Let's call it XXX. And at this yeah. point, at this point, 25 million of those 10 million shares fill. They're totally cool holding this 25 million order that's left and just leaving it there. And that's the whole point. As price grinds, it can go straight back down to that level or it can go slowly sideways and grind back to that level. It is assumed that when it gets to this level and that you don't like... I'm just using these numbers like as arbitrary numbers. Like You don't know there's 50 million shares of order there. You don't know. But it's assumed that they have those orders still there. And as that starts to react from those orders, you can create a low-risk trade. So let's say this is the trade I buy on the reaction. My stops go just underneath my targets or structure highs. And boof, it rallies back. That is the first setup. The other setup is exactly the same way on the other side. If price gets to a location where fair value is high and you have a very steep price decline from that location, it's the same concept. It's expected as price moves back into this location again and reacts from it. You can create a low risk trade, entry stops, market structures exits and the reason supply and demand trading is so good in my opinion is that it really offers like some of the absolute best risk to reward ratios of any style of trading whatsoever period no questions like you'll get like five and ten to one trades and it is absolutely freaking phenomenal so and that's the first really the first two setups it's basically just flipped and then the second setup is the same story price moves up it bases a little bit and then fair value and from there it poof and then it's exactly the same strong rally from a rally and then it returns to that location poof this is kind of the trend situation same thing on the other side price is moving down it bases for a bit and then steep decline and price returns so that is the entire supply and demand premise here. Works on any time frame. So instead of using just this little line tool, let's delete that and throw it away and go back to where we were trading a minute ago, huh? How about right here, huh? Now, in this scenario, it is very, very clear that right here, price based out. This is a rally into a base into another rally. So this is what we call the RBR setup, rally base rally. And at this level, we create a demand zone. So how do we draw said demand zone is with this little box tool. Check this out. Oh, shit. Now, we have this. Look at exactly where this trend turned again. This price wicks all the way down here, and this reaction is absolutely insane from this I level. I got to run. See you later. 
So, later. If we can get into this trade somewhere in this area here, as we start to react from that with stops here, market structure highs are here, targets, right? So, this is it. This is the whole thing. Reaction from demand. Targets. Let's. That's what four times. That's a four times. This is one R. And this is four R. So if we win this trade, we're going to make four times that we lose. Right. That's the trade. And that's why supply and demand is so stupid good. And now we can kind of talk about which options ignore which options we buy at this at this point which options do we buy at this point right so generally with options if you are on a daily chart i would suggest nothing less than way more time than what you think you need so in this scenario let's just count how long it took for this here to hit this price level so this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 days it took to hit price targets here. That's 20 days. So if we had bought a 7-day option here, we would end up, we'd do pretty good, but it's not what we want because... So, always take more time than what you need. If you think you need 21 days, take 45 days. If you think you need 45 days, take 3 months. If you think you need 3 days, take 7 days. Unless specifically you are day trading, right? Then take, you know, the closest expiration that you can take, in my humble opinion. So, that is one supply and demand setup. Now, let's talk about fresh supply and demand. And so fresh demand is an untested level. So this at this point is a fresh level. Now, if this same level is tested again, which it is, it is not a fresh level anymore. So it still works on this second scenario. But each time after it's not going to do as well, right? So this still works. It's the same level. It's And it really just depends kind of on gauging the strength of the reaction. I would consider this a very strong reaction from this level, so I would take the second trade. If this reaction hadn't been as strong at this point, I wouldn't take the second trade. I never ever ever don't ever take the third or the fourth level until you create new levels so at this point if you take this trade just understand that this is still the trade this is a very strong level of supply that's the target don't take the third one right so just just leave it at that okay so here's the other setup on the other side of that. Straight up is a decline, which would be a drop into balance price into a drop. So this, in this situation, creates supply. This is the trade. Reaction from supply, stop losses, targets. So what happens in this scenario is it actually retests this level. And this is kind of where sort of um, the, uh, what do you call it, uh, discretion comes in, right? So at this point, when it retests this level, you can do a couple of things. If it respects that level again, you can average into a position if you're comfortable taking on more risk and adding more at this level. Or 
you can get out at break even or you can take you know slightly smaller targets as long as those slightly smaller targets are at least two times your risk you're fine so if your risk is one here and you're two times away at a later point and you don't think you're going to be able to get all the way to your target just take the two times instead so that's kind of where discretionary trading comes in but look Let's draw this actually properly. So this is technically the entire level. As this sort of develops in price action, I would adjust it. Because I don't like to use such big, 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 big levels. Me personally, I would go down to a smaller time frame and find out the exact places that this started. Like the exact level of balance here. And then maybe I get out of this one at break even, but maybe the second one I actually take with a smaller target. So like in this scenario, it comes back and retests. Maybe I either hold it or maybe I add a contract here since I, you know, let's say I only took one or two here. Maybe I add one more here. And then in this scenario, this is my risk. Uh, maybe here, so this is still two times my risk. Maybe I'll take it all off here instead because market context is that this is printing a very bullish pin bar right there I'm at least two times away so in order to be safe I would just go ahead and take the whole thing or maybe I just scale half of it maybe I scale three quarters of it that's really discretion and then see the third time this test it actually does work the third time so three times is probably the maximum limit I would take here and that's only the third time if it was a very, very strong rejection. Like this level here, this is a very, very strong bearish candle. But in this context, it's earning. So, But look, same kind of situation. This creates a demand level at this location. And price V-shaped reversal pattern, entry stop losses price gap is the exit very very simple 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 trading strategy okay here's uh, another one sideways trading sideways trading sideways trading sideways trading very strong level of demand because it creates a very sharp rally from this location and then Oh, well, that didn't work the way I thought it was going to. This level ever gets tested again, I assume. Okay, so here's one, right? So, this technically here, this whole little sideways thing would be considered a range. But let's assume that you put your level of demand here instead of the whole thing down here for the second ones. I'm going to make the bottom of that a different color. So let's just assume, and we do it all the time, it happens, we get antsy. And then we finally get back there. But remember, context, at this point, this is a very, very bearish candle. There is no zero, zero, zero indication of a bullish reaction from this first level that you drew. Do not go ahead and jump in. This is not a very bullish candle. This is not a very bullish candle. None of these give you any indication that this is going to have a strong reaction. When you trade so apply and demand, you want very, very decisive, strong reactions. This is not a very decisive, strong reaction. We are looking for unfilled institutional orders. We are not looking for sideways trading channels. We want supply to get in. We want to hit to demand, and we want to shoot back out of that damn thing like, like a rocket. We want very strong bulls at this level. And see, it doesn't quite do shit at this point. It does eventually do things. But understand that at this point, it is not a demand level because there is no demand. 
it is a support level. And support and resistance and supply and demand are not the same thing. You can trade based on support and resistance, which is fine, but understand it is not a demand level. This is just a regular S support. And you have to take different precautions when you take those different trades. So at this point, there's not a very strong reaction. This time, the second time when it comes back, right, this gives you a very bullish candlestick pattern. Look. I would almost argue that at this point we create new demand here when this rally starts and then when it retests that's a bullish engulfing pattern there previous structure highs day before earnings go ahead and take your shit and get out but right here's that gap set up again anyway that's pretty much all there is to supply and demand trading. And we've been here for a lot longer than I thought we were going to be. Uh, more questions, concerns, answers? Anybody? Anybody? Questions, concerns, comments? Do we learn stuff? There's some free book. Oh, there's some books I posted in the Discord on uh, price action trading and supply and demand trading and uh, volume price analysis and all kinds of other things that I strongly suggest that you all check out. Um, the chartered market technician stuff that's in there. Um, that shit costs $300 a book. Read it. I like to listen to you in here, man. <laughs> when I get a chance. Um, you're breaking out, bud. <sighs> I said when I get a chance. You keep cutting out right after you say when I get a chance. <laughs> Or you you got to hold down the push to talk button. I'm holding it down. Now it's Is working. That... I don't know. Can you just type whatever you're about to say? Okay, nobody's got anything else. I am going to scooch on out of here. You missed the gap logic. It's got to be settings. Settings. It's got to be my settings. It's working now. Oh, okay. Good. That... Oh, and then it quit. Somebody said they missed the gap logic. Um, Gaps create levels. That's basically the only logic behind it. Like, think about what it takes to cause a gap. A very, very strong imbalance of one side or another. So in this case, this gap down creates a very strong imbalance of sellers at this price location. So generally, when a gap fills, like it does here, there's still a very strong imbalance of sellers at that gap and you can create a trade there. Stops, sideways, poof. If you ever get a chance, can you... You are cutting out like halfway through. I'm not sure what's happening. I'll send you a... Yeah, send me a DM. Yeah, I will. Which comment, Brian? Type it in chat. Most of the problems that people are going to have are not technically based because learning 
a price setup or one single thing like a setup is not difficult. What's difficult is being able to admit that this isn't working right now. I need to get out. So if you can't do that, if you can't take a stop and if you can't allow yourself to let a trade to run to an actual target all you do is skew a risk reward ratio if you go into a trade with let's just you know if I get into a trade like let's say this happens and I play in this little double bottom right I drew a little double bottom if I take this trade and my stop is just the respect you know below that right just below that and my target is two times away and what happens is if it moves up a little bit I'm like holy crap I made 50 bucks but I'm risking a hundred bucks and it starts to trade sideways for a little bit and now at this point if I go ahead and exit that trade at fifty dollars a gain and Lee and my risk has always been a hundred I'm taking a one to two a one reward, a ha not even a one to two. I'm risking a hundred dollars to make fifty bucks. So now I am putting myself at a disadvantage right out of the gates. What I can do in this situation instead is put it into my plan that if a trade goes fifty dollars into my favor, I'll move my stops to break even. So that way, the outcome now is zero risk or total reward. But it has to be part of the original plan. So for me, that thing is, is if I have a risk of, let's say, 50 bucks, and my trade moves 50 bucks into my favor, and I have more than one contract, I will sell, let's just say I have two, I'll sell one contract at one times risk, so now my risk is zero, and then I will move my stops to break even. If I have just one contract, I will move my stops to break even at that point. But that's part of my my plan, right? And then I'll just leave it alone and let it do its thing. If I'm day trading and I have one contract, I take targets, no questions. If I have two contracts, I'll scale out of contracts to reduce risk along the way. And my exit for my final position is a five-minute candle that prints a new high or a new low, whichever side I'm trading. So that way, I am in the trade until I get an exit. Uh, stochastic means over 20, oversold, over 80, overbought. What? Why are you yelling? Okay, yeah, I forgot. Indicators. Let's do it. Uh, let's talk about I guess the stochastic first, right? Stochastic. So if you want to use indicators, indicators are fine as well. Um, let me find it. The I like the slow stochastic. Slow stochastics, fast stochastics, it doesn't matter. So this is just a standard stochastic indicator. If you want to use indicators to strengthen something right so just part of your rules right let's assume that my trading setup is still based in supply and demand and i have a demand level drawn at this gap cool now what i can do is use these indicators to confirm my setup right so let's just say has to be at a demand level stochastic has to be oversold hooking up and that happens here this is oversold at 20, overbought at 80. Um, Stochastic confirms my price setup. It doesn't tell me my price setup. Because look here, Stochastic is oversold here. And price goes down. Stochastic's overbought all the way through all of this price action. And price goes up. Use indicators to confirm your price-based setups. Not you Don't use indicators to tell you your price based setups and I would strongly suggest not having more than a few indicators so like if you're going to use a stochastic and let's say 
a couple of moving averages, that's fine. Or if you're going to use a stochastic in MACD, that's fine. Or if you're going to use a stochastic in uh, RSI, that's fine. Sorry. If you're going to use, um, so like in this scenario, right here, if I want to be extra, extra safe, this is the same trade. Demand level, stochastic oversold, MACD hooking up, changing to bullish in the momentum there. So both of these indicators confirm my setup. That just gives me added confirmation. It doesn't mean that because everything is lined up that I should double my risk or take on extra risk. It just gives... It's just about how you like to do things. And I don't do these things. <laughs> I don't like them. Yeah, MACD is just a momentum indicator. So stochastics and RSI are basically the same thing. Overbought and oversold indicators. Um... First things, I don't really ever much recommend changing these things from their default settings because if you're using the default setting, that's going to be the setting that almost everybody's using and you should probably leave it that way. Uh, stochastics and RSI are generally going to look pretty close to the same, especially the slow stochastic, right? A new follower. So the slow stochastic and the RSI are almost going to be the same. Uh, you can use them several ways. I have videos on this channel as well explaining different uses of these indicators that you should check out, but in a very basic sense. I think we've done the RSI, the Stochastic, the MACD, uh, probably the Bollinger Bands, and a couple of others. I know we've done one on the VWAP as well. So if you missed those, you should go check them out. If a wick or a shadow touches the 50 EMA, would that count as it touching the 50 or any other EMA? Or does the candle have to touch the EMA to be considered hit or can a wick count? Well, a wick is the candle touching. A wick is part of the candle. So if, for instance, this green line's the 50 EMA... Let's just say you use these EMAs, and I do use these EMAs sometimes when I am day trading. If some of you watch, I use them for price targets and things like that. Let's just say right here, this whole the whole candle, like the wick and everything, is part of the price action. <coughs> so let's say my trading strategy is I like to buy bounces off of the 50 moving average in this scenario. This is a bounce off of a 50 moving average because if this were just a line chart, it would look like this. What is that? That's a bounce off of the 50 moving average. And that's a very that's a valid strategy as long as it offers favorable risk rewards. And it does. Entries, exits, targets two times away. Entries, exits, targets two times away. That's a valid strategy, and it's a very popular strategy. People do it all of the time. Entries, exits, targets two times away. Three candle reversal pattern. Or, let's two contract it. Entry, exit, target one, target two is candle to break the nine day EMA. That away, we we ride and we exit. Catch the whole thing. Same thing on the other end. Entry. <clears throat> targets doesn't matter how you trade as long as you have good risk to reward and a valid setup that you didn't just create out of blue moon on some fancy ass crazy math and shit <coughs> you 
you don't see any difference between support and resistance and supply and demand because you uh, there's the levels are basically the same, but there's a difference. Um, supply and demand is essentially support and resistance, but a fresh level of supply or a fresh level of demand is not going to be a support and resistance. Um, so essentially, you look for brand new support and brand new resistance. So right here, we talked about it earlier, this is a rally, a two candle base into a rally. So that's the rally base rally. That creates brand new support essentially at this level. Check this out. So this is balanced price. Right here, for two whole days, buyers and sellers were in agreement that this price level is fair. And then we create an imbalance in buyers. Now, look what happened. Poof. If you were drawing support and resistance levels, That's where you would have your shit. This is a fresh, brand new level of support. Now, scroll a little farther and see if we touch it again, eventually. Kinda. Maybe. Yeah, I would consider that close. It's basically all there is to it. I don't really, um, there's a bunch of books and things that I have posted and things like that to sort of explain this. You just have to practice and study, I suppose. I'm not going to be able to teach you everything there is to teach about this style of trading in two hours. <clears throat> And obvi what? Man. obviously, hindsight is 100% percent twenty twenty. so you can look around and see things. If you have Thinkorswim, there's a tool, it's called the on-demand tool that you should absolutely 100% use to practice any setup, doesn't matter if it's my setup, your setup, any setup at all. You can go through price action, pick any date in history, and start there. And trade. So, so does on demand actually acts like a, like actually like a day trading like uh, like a, in 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 that day how the trading went is that how it works? On demand, you can take orders, you can buy, you can sell, you can do whatever you want. You can buy options, you can buy shares, you can set price targets, you can do whatever you want, and then just keep time keeps rolling like it did. Or if you don't have Webull. Or if you don't have Thinkorswim and you want to use Webull, you can do it the old-fashioned way and close your eyes and scroll to wherever the hell you scroll to. And, ooh, we're all the way back to where PFE was a bar chart. Let's get back to candles. Scroll all the way to wherever the hell you want to scroll to. And did I just change that on accident? Nope, there we go. And now you can... Okay, so let's say right here, I'm going to draw a level. Now, what I can do is scroll one candle at a time and basically take trades in my brain, right? So, okay, so right there, I would consider this a reaction from supply and demand. So what I can do now is sort of, I use a little box tool, I'll draw like some targets in and I'll draw my risk in and then I'll just scroll and see if it gets hit and in this scenario I got stopped out and lost and you can practice that way 
and then now I would just wait and keep a little notepad next to you so you can track your um, wins and losses and things like that. So I probably would have taken one of these trades in here somewhere and won. I would have taken this trade. There's a to climb, but I would have taken it for here. Keep track of this in terms of risk, not in terms of dollar values. So like if this is my 1R, this is 2 or 3R. So that way you know the expectancy of if I risk 1R, I'm going to make, let's, I don't know, say 50R over the course of one year trading this strategy. And that's how you kind of gain confidence in your trading style and how you tweak it to suit you. And let's just say you've discovered that if you only trade the very lowest portion, the lowest 50% of a demand zone, your R increases by 10. Okay, so now we know that our R increases by 10 on a year if we only trade the lowest half. And this is just me spitball in here so maybe we can adjust that strategy to where we only trade it if we're in the lower register of um a demand level or maybe we've did some back testing and we found out that we have better expectancy if we only take demand levels where the rsi is also oversold that increases our um our gains by however much it increases by and this is how you test strategies and how you formulate your own strategies is you test it and you use historical data and you find out what works and what doesn't work if you like indicators then you test these things with your indicators or you want to try out a new indicator on your strategy. You don't do that with real money. If I wanted to try out the RSI and the MACD combined with supply and demand, I would go and do this for uh, weeks, days, months. I would, depending on how much time I put in, I would look at all kinds of different tickers. I would look at all kinds of different um, scenarios and find out what works the best so like let's just say i want now i want macd to be showing bullish momentum i want rsi to be under 40 and curling up before i take a trade okay so here boom boom i would take this trade macd's bullish rsi is curling up i would take this trade and that's just kind of how you do things like you have to put in that work <clears throat> yes but this yes. will be a swing trade right not a day trade doesn't matter it's the same it's the exact same um let me find something current it is the literal exact same uh, okay but how isn't that what price change more on a daily versus on a uh, on a one minute Price change is exactly the same on a daily chart as it does on a one minute. It's just smaller time frames. Price is the price is the price is the price. Right? Yep. <clears throat> so let's just do it like this. Okay, so let's assume that I am day trading SPY. And I draw this level, very short term. This is like a bottom pivot, small demand, right? Now, let's say I go down to an hourly chart. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Look at the level created. Now I can adjust this. Same level. I didn't do anything. And I'm very patient, and look what happens on an hourly chart. It's the exact same level right here. 
this would be the structure that I would be considering. And in this scenario, if I were day trading, I have to look at shorter term market structure. So in this scenario, this day, this is still a very strong level of demand. In this scenario, this on an hourly chart is an hourly demand level. See, price basis here, or an hourly supply level, I'm sorry, price basis, and then price drops from said base. So in this scenario, if I were to take this trade long, this supply level is previous market structure highs. So if I take this trade, it's still a good trade. This is my risk. This is my reward. It's the exact same thing. If I'm looking at an hourly chart, it's the same. I would have this level. Okay, so let's do this a different if I'm looking at a daily chart, let's just say I draw my daily levels orange. I'm going to draw my hourly levels. Um, let's draw them gray. Let's leave them this gray color. Uh, let's make them dark gray, actually. So this is my hourly level. This is me today. This is important today. Let's say this is the day we're trading. This is important for these three days. Now, let's say I go to a 15-minute chart. Let's go back to the same day. This level still exactly the same. If I were trading based day trading based on supply and demand, this is a short trade. This is the target daily demand. That is a stupid good day trade. If I'm trading on a five minute chart, it's the same story. If I see the next day that this is opening up in demand, and creating new demand on a 15 minute chart and that new demand gets tested. Now, this is the day trade. Still targets two times away. Risk, reward. If I'm trading on a five minute chart, it's the exact same thing. The levels are still there, they are still important. See, this was an hourly level of demand or supply on a daily chart. We open here. This is the high pivot of the day. So what we can do in this case, this is a five minute five minute base, right? Now. We have an hourly demand, an hourly supply, a five minute supply. We have targets, previous structures. This is the risk. Three candle reversal pattern. So maybe even this is the risk. And this is the reward. That looks like a three or four to one to me. Right? Skippy, skippy. <clears throat> and let's say we had two contracts. We can maybe even sell one here. And then let the other one run. And if this breaks now, what we can do is have a little bit more freedom here. So let's say we took that trade. This was our target. We hit that target. We sold one. We held one. So now we've created a five minute sort of supply level here. Let's say now if this level breaks, we'll sell the other one. If it doesn't break, then we'll just keep trailing. Okay, we've got a new five minute level. And then that actually doesn't create any kind of new sort of highs until here. So you get much extra. So so you so you go from daily to hourly to five minutes like zooming in. Yeah, you have to watch the rest of this video. I think you showed up late, didn't you? I came late in. Yeah, I... Every single time frame is important. If you go buy a book, you won't skip right to the end and start reading, will you? No, no, of course not. The five minute and the one minute charts are the ending of your book. You have to start at the beginning. 
the weekly, the daily, the hourly, the 30, the 5, the 1, whatever. I use the daily, the hourly, the 5 minute, and the 1 minute when I'm day trading. But a lot of people use the daily, the hourly, the 30, and the 15. And I look at all of these time frames sometimes because context is important. I look at the weekly. If you're at a strong, strong level on a weekly chart and you're trying to play against that tide, you are going to lose. Really? Absolutely. If you are at a very, very strong level of demand that is getting reacted from on a weekly chart and you're trying to play short trades, your probability of success is going to be significantly lower. If you are at a strong level of supply on a weekly, a strong level of supply on a daily, and a strong level of supply on an hourly chart, and you go short, you're probably going to win. So you're saying that it's like more like look at daily, then zoom out to hourly, and then 15, and then probably 5. If you're looking at the daily, you're only reading the end, the ending to the book. You don't know where the book, uh, you don't know how you got there. Market context I is see. important. It matters. <clears throat> I see I see what you mean. Um, Brian, Ben, you're talking about politics and things and fundamentals i the only thing that i use fundamentals for is popular interest if uh elon musk says he's buying twitter i'm gonna be trading twitter because twitter's going to have a lot of volatility and volatility creates opportunity but it's the same thing twitter same story this is kind of very volatile price action same story this is an hourly this is the base. Price is important. Hourly base. Check out what happens here. We hit the base and five minute chart. This is a breakout. Blah, 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 blah. Same so story. When you live trade, you don't draw these patterns. This is it like you're drawing your mind? Yeah. Damn. <laughs> I, I, I usually use vertical just lines when I'm trading live. When I'm trading live, this is this is kind of what I would do. Like, right? This this is technically the level. Sideways price action, extremely strong rally from that sideways price action, and but when I'm day trading, I only take. Like the very best price. I want the very best price. So here, anywhere in here, I would enter this trade long. With a stop probably just under that. And my targets would probably be somewhere in here. Which was very probably likely VWAP, yeah, VWAP would be my target in this situation. <clears throat> I did take this trade. We took this in the live chat. Somewhere in here, I think. And then just got out like two or three minutes later. I think we got in like right in here. Yeah, and then got out like right there. Still two to one. One. Do. Can you borrow my mind? Uh, you've borrowed my mind for two and two hours or something like that. Almost two and a half hours, and my mind is now going on cooldown mode. <laughs> Last minute questions, because I am not sitting here all day. You mean you don't like us? I love each and every single one of you with all with all of my black little heart. Black brown heart, bud. Uh, like, subscribe, comment. Uh, I, I appreciate you taking time to do this. Like, subscribe, comment. Give me money. I like money. 
<laughs> How do I pick stocks to trade? Uh, there is another video on this channel uh, it, annotating exactly how I create my watch list and things like that. So you'll just have to scroll through the, the other videos. It's pretty long. Hey, Vox, so I, just, a, just a question. So I took a um, 440 call on Thursday closing. I thought the SPY was, had a support zone at between like 437.50 and 439. Do you think that's a good trade? Because it closed right, like I took it like at 4, 410 for 440 call because it was not breaking that 437.5. Do you think it's a good trade? In the morning, Ivy, yeah, but if it's down, then I'm going to be fine. Do you have a stop loss? Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, I have a stop loss. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you have a price target that's at least two times away from your stop loss? Yeah, so I think 440, 442 is the next resistance, so I will sell it 442. Sounds like you got a plan to me. That's a good trade. Oh, I'm learning. Phew. It doesn't you don't need my validation for your trade ideas. If you plan a trade that has a good risk to reward, it does not matter. And this is something that everybody in here needs to learn. What I think does not matter. What some analyst on NBC thinks does not matter. All that matters is that you take a trade that's low risk and high probable reward. And you let that trade play. Don't let me, don't let somebody else, if I'm like, whoa, dude, you're being dumb right now. Don't listen to me. You planned that trade. You put in that work to make that trade happen. Have confidence in yourself. If you get stopped out, who cares? You got stopped out. You respected your stops. You took a little bitty loss. If you win, you're going to make all of your money that you set out to make and I was wrong, you were right, doesn't matter. So there's going to be some days where you're right and I'm wrong. There's going to be some days where I'm right and you're wrong. All that matters is that you create low risk, high reward trades. Nothing else matters. Yep, that sounds good to me. If I take, just for instance, every single day, the first five minute candle and wait for that to close and buy. The next high over that candle with a stop under the lows and target two times away. Or I buy the next low and target two times away. Statistically, I am going to make money end over end, week over week, hand over foot. Because I have positive risk to reward ratios. It does not matter everything else. The setup is a good setup. It's a five minute uh range break it's a popular setup it happens same story here five minute candle this one's pretty shitty because the candle's too big there's a lot more to it than that but this one's too big i would have taken this range instead in this scenario and yeah the most important thing is Risk to reward. See here again. This is a good candle. Five minute candle. Close. Stops. Entries. Two times out. Done. Five minute candle. Low. Stops. How do how do you identify reversal? Um, with trading setups. Opening range, stops, entries two times out. It's just you learn setups and you trade those setups with good rewards. Or you create your own setups once you've learned setups that have worked for 25 years. Five minute candle, opening range, break, stops two times out. <clears throat> opening range break has been traded break, since traded. the dawn of time. Opening well, range, you. five minute break. Down two times out done. Yeah, I, I, I've seen you um, in live, right? So it's like before, range. Even, before it even reverses, you know it. Um, 
It depends, I guess. I, I don't know. I've been doing this a really long time, and I can kind of gauge the strength or weakness of a trend or candles just by how the candles are printing. And I watch the order flow. Um, I see how many shares are being bought at certain levels, and I I don't know. <laughs> that's that's something I can't explain to you. I know, I know. Practice makes a man perfect, and it has made you in there, so. Five minute range. Break. So this is. Sometimes I got lucky and caught the reversal where I made money on spy call and put both in a single day, but those instances are real. Opening ranges are the business, by the way. It's one of my. I love trading the opening range break. Yeah, no, you have said in the past you. At, if it closes, you in red you buy debit. If it closes in high, you buy debit, right? Or credit rather. See this one would have lost. Five minute range stops. That one would have lost. But what's that like? Seven wins to one loss there. It's opening range breakouts are really, really, really good trade to learn. Here's this candle. I probably wouldn't have taken this because the stop's way, way too wide. I would have taken this instead probably as a VWAP trade. So, like essentially you've got that range break, but that's a really big stop for a day trade. Um, it tries to pop VWAP. It does pop VWAP and reject, so I would have taken this short in here. Nice, I see it. Opening range candle here. New high, same story. I would have used VWAP as a stop. Nice. The problem with Spy is that if Spy goes one way wrong, the big rife candle kills it. Mm. There's not a candle is a candle is a candle. Doesn't matter if it's spy, AMC, AMD, AMS, WWWF, or <laughs> <laughs> this one would have lost to five minute range stops entry. This one would have lost. Probably would have maybe even got out at break even in this situation. Anyway. I yep, look? I will let you go. You should enjoy some time, play some game. There's a whole series on reading level two. The important thing to know about reading level two data is that you it's just one of the it's a learned skill. You're it they go especially with spy, it goes really, really, really fast on spy. And reading level two data is a lot harder now than it was 10 years ago because there's so many people trading now that weren't trading 10 years ago. And, like me. and it's just, you can still do it and it's still helpful, but like they're meaningful prints and you just have to watch this to find those meaningful prints and you have to watch it more and more and more. And you can see when you see price levels that are printing over and over and over again or printing very large orders over and over again, um, it gives you information that you don't get by just looking at this. You can see exactly how many shares are bought at a certain level. You can see how many shares are being sold at a certain level. If you're looking here on this for instance and there's a huge huge bid at let's just say let's say 480 thir this 438 offers like fucking 40,000 shares and you're watching this and you get like green print after green print after green print after green print on this 438.40 and this goes down to like 10,000 very very quickly and then 5,000 and then right before that offer lifts it refreshes to 40,000 again that is a pretty good indication that that's a very 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 strong seller who keeps refreshing his offer there and you can probably short at that location 
and use that offer as your stop. So this 438.43, if that guy lifts, you can just stop out immediately because he was what was holding the price down and now he's gone. So there's no reason for him to hold the price down anymore. And there's no reason for you to be in that trade because he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. If this 438.43 guy is still here at 40,000, then he steps down to 434 at 40,000. Then he steps down to 433 at 40,000. You can follow his big ass order all the way down until he fills everything he wants to sell. And when that offer lifts, you just exit. But don't they, they have gotten smart. They break it down to a huge order. They break it down to smaller numbers, right? No, it's always been like that. You just have to watch the prints. If you're, I, I try to watch print, but it kind of, I, I think it's just you said, I think it's a practice thing. Because a lot of time I take a spy trade just by taking print. Because as you said, once those green starts coming in, you can just take order. Oh, I'm I'm not going over level two data. There's a whole video series on my channel. I'm just saying you're not going to be super good at it when you start out. But if you watch the prints, watch the prints and watch the prints and watch the prints and watch the prints, you will start to pick things up. Watch the prints, awesome. watch the bids and the offers. Learn the basics. I have a very I have a course on my thing teaches you all the basics and then it's free. Go watch it. It's on my YouTube channel. Um, watch it. Watch it. Shit, it is. And then just watch the prints. <clears throat> when you're not trading, sit at your desk, at your desk. and watch the prints. Oh, I do. I, I, that's what I do. When I play a trade, I watch the L level 2 like a <clears> half. <throat> It's, it's more than watching big orders. Yet big orders have context, and big buyers and big sellers have context. Like a big offer that's lifting, that's getting eaten very, very quickly by buyers. Like in the same scenario, if that $40,000 offer had went to 20, 30, 10, 5, 1 very quickly and doesn't refresh, that's a very bullish indication because buyers are chewing that guy's order up they are very eager to buy at his 438 it's funny you said that because one of my friends who trades like a swinger he he has told me that if your whatever side of the bid is not refreshing that's the one that you want to go in if you have a held bid or a held or a held offer that keeps refreshing on the same ECN, that means you have a very big buyer, a very big seller at a certain price location, or somebody's accumulating or um, distributing shares, and that's that's it. Anyway, in the spirit of not sitting here for another two hours talking about level two prints, just go watch the videos on my channel and watch the prints. Will do, sir. Thank you so much for the Easter. <laughs> and that's going to conclude today. I am done. We ain't doing nothing else. <laughs> Find some Easter egg walk. You guys have fun. This video will be on the channel at a certain particular time in the near future, as soon as it's done processing. Um, like, subscribe, comment, send me money. I like money. Don't send me money. I don't really care. Um, love all you of you. Take my money. Make me spy win every day. <laughs> Cheers. But no, thank you so much, Walk. Have a good day and happy Easter. You too.